Good morning, everybody. <laughs> I, I actually just tweeted that um, for those of you that were in the natural wine debate, um, since that was more of a workshop, I'm wondering whether this is going to be more of a debate. Um, but welcome and, and thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Wink Lorch, and my panelists today are Sue Birch from Wines of South Africa, Per Carlson from uh, BK Wine, Wendy Crispell, Food and Wine in New York, and Paula Titch, uh, I can never say the name of your blog, Swip, Swap, Swip, Shoosh, something like that. Um, I will tell you more about them later on. Um, so my name's Wink Lorch, I've been working in wine forever, and in the past 20 years as a wine communicator, an educator, an editor, writer, and for more than five years, a lot of that has been online. Um, it strikes me that many blogs, many websites about wine, and even books follow the same old formula of talking about appellations, terroir, grape varieties, producers, and so on, and don't necessarily put this in context. Um, there and there are the other blogs and the other websites and the other books that are simply wine guides with wine tasting notes or, God help us, wine scores, which are in fact being debated in another room in this uh, conference. Um, I think more relevant to many is to look at wine and food and travel in context. And that is exactly what this workshop is about, to discuss how perhaps some of us are doing this already and how we can do it better. And more importantly, how we can be the trusted source for our sphere of interest, um, where we can go for that. Um, I, as I said, want to set the parameters for this. What this workshop really is, is a discussion on how we integrate those three things together, wine, food and travel, in particular in online communications. Because I very much want this to be uh, your workshop as well as ours, um, I'm hoping that we have at least 20 minutes, maybe 30 minutes for questions and discussions from the floor at the end. But in setting the boundaries, I want to tell you what this workshop is not, <laughs> which is how to monetize. Those of you that will know me know that I am absolutely the worst one to uh, discuss monetization, and that is, I'm pleased to say, also being covered in another panel. So moving swiftly on from that, I wanted to talk to you uh, briefly that I'm not the only one, and I want to name names. Um, Jancis Robinson wrote an article recently in the FT that was also on her website, which was in fact discussing uh, a new wine and food matching initiative by some wild chef somewhere. And she wrote at the introduction to this, when long ago I wrote for the London Sunday Times, I used to say I wanted to be the Good Times correspondent. My argument was, that although the paper's writers tended to have specialities, wine, food, and travel among them, readers, in fact, tend to experience all of these particular pleasures of life together. So wouldn't it be a good idea to have someone writing about all three in one glorious amalgam? This is sort of some of the inspiration for many of the things I've done. Effectively, we, most of us here, are living the dream. We talk to people about what we do, and they say, wow, I'd love to do what you do. It, it's just a fabulous thing. But what actually are people dreaming about? They're not dreaming about wine. How many people actually dream about wine? They don't, no, you don't. <laughs> you dream, I, well, okay, wine producers amongst you probably do. <laughs> But mere mortals, consumers, the, our readers, our watchers, don't usually just dream about wine. They dream about wine in its surroundings, perhaps with food, perhaps with a beautiful place, perhaps with a sunset, um, and perhaps with other people. They're, pre, uh, they're uh, important too. And somehow we've got to find ways to communicate this dream, especially for those that aspire to live the dream that we are living. 
Um, very much this dream is everything around wine and incorporating wine. Coming on to practicalities in these worlds of food and travel, um, I think that, that uh, although I haven't looked up statistics, the websites devoted to travel and to food, the recipe sites, the travel guides, and so on, they are all far more visited than our wine blogs and our wine sites are. So I believe that if we can actually incorporate these two things, we could have a winning mix if we could put the three together. Because what we've really got is a menage à trois, the three things, the perfect menage à trois, wine, food, and travel online. So my belief is that we should all try and become a source communicating solid, reliable information. In my own experience, my background is wine, but has been for years and years and years forever. When I write a blog post or an article that incorporates quite detailed facts about food or about a place, before I hit publish, I check and check again that I've got those facts right. I check God help us, Wikipedia. But I check the generic resource. I check what other people have been written. I double check and double check. Because personally, I'm not confident that I've necessarily got those facts about how this particular sausage is made correct or what the history of this particular beach or, or woodland or historic antique thing is. It doesn't come to me as automatically as facts about wine. And essential is that we get those facts right, check, check, check again, and that at the same time, when we're talking about wine, we don't alienate people. We want to bring them in. We want to share wine um, and everything about it in a, an understandable way. Above all, we need to share the dream. We're living it. Somehow we've got to find ways to share it. Now, I'm very much hoping that our four panelists will have some ideas as to, to how to do this. So I'm going to introduce them one by one, and they're going to give you some thoughts based around a question I have posed them. Um, forgive them and me if they don't answer the question directly. It was really just a way that was food for thought. So first of all, um, allow me to introduce you to Sue Birch uh, on my right uh, from Wines of South Africa. Um, Sue has been the CEO for over a decade for WOZA. Um, WOZA are the exporting voice for South African wines based in Stellenbosch. Now, in South Africa, wine tourism is extremely important for South Africa wineries, and WOZA has been the driving force behind the inaugural South African wine tourism event, which was held last month uh, in Cape Town alongside Cape Wine 2012. Um, I asked Sue to think about what approach works most successfully when independent communicators who visit South Africa, when they write or post photographs and videos um, concerning the many wine tourism opportunities in South Africa. But I know that she's got lots to share with us about things over there. Thank, over to you, Sue. I think we've heard that successful writing is storytelling, and I think this is especially the case in wine tourism. The experience has to be more than wine, and it, I think it has to be more than food. To most of the world's consumers, a wine, one winery is very much like another one. One barrel looks like another one. And malolactic fermentation and sous vide cooking are as interesting as cement. When people go on holiday, they want to have fun. If you ask them what they wanted to do, they would probably tell you they want to drink cold wine and have hot sex. But if we are going to write about the experience, I think the key thing is that we have to let our um, readers see that they can experience something authentic, that they can touch something real. And when we, for example, in South Africa, when Wozer started promoting the conservation of the Cape Floral Kingdom in our wine lands, Many of the producers thought they were nuts. We were nuts. 
And they kept saying things like, that woman and her flowers, you know, why doesn't she just get on and sell wine? But over the past few years, they've realized that to connect with consumers, young consumers today especially, are more concerned about stories around things like the rivers that have started to run for the first time in decades, the pictures of the leopards that are taken by flash cameras at night on the mountains, the discovery of a new to the world flower variety on that wine farm, the raiding of the vineyards by baboons. These are, are things that really touch consumers today and get them excited. And I think also telling stories about people, not cliches about passionate winemakers, but I hate that word, but if, you know, stories about their eccentricities, their, the fact that they've got manure between their toes and they've, those are the stories people want, want to, to hear about. And I think in our own country, the success of the Swartland winemakers who have almost no budget and um, are very new and have made a considerable impact isn't just about their wines, it's about their attitude to life and to having fun. And when we're having fun, I think that um, it's not just enough, as I said, to talk about food and wine. The more, the more you offer in your story, the more interesting it is to your reader. The more diverse the product offering, the, the bigger the appeal. You know, if dad is into wine, what is mom going to do? If both parents are into wine, what can the kids do? So it's about cookery courses, eco walks, mountain biking, horse riding, farmers markets, craft markets, <coughs> chocolate tastings, township experiences, four by four safaris, um, game watching. All of these are what add flavor and richness to your stories and texture to your videos. I think the whole authentic personality is really important. Consumers nowadays, especially young consumers, they look for authentic cues, especially in social media, to decide, I am like that, or I like that. And your stories need to capture those, that imagination, and the charisma of your stories needs to, to connect with them at that level. Thanks. Thank you, Sue. That's great. Lots of thoughts about not using the term passionate winemakers in particular. <laughs> My uh, next panellist um, is Per Carlsson. Um, per is uh, from Sweden originally, but uh, he and his wife, Britt, uh, live in Paris, and together they run uh, award-winning tours, both in English and in Swedish, to wine regions in Europe and the New World. Um, they've also gained recognition for their writing, um, and uh, Per is one of five people only on Wine Business International's power list of wine communicators in Sweden. Very daunting. Um, Pear's a very keen blogger and a professional photographer too. And in a previous life, Pear worked in marketing and telecommunications. Um, I asked <coughs> Pear in particular to think about what sort of communication styles really go well down well with his wine tour clients and how important that integration of photos and videos of the, the meals and the locations and so on is. Um, over to you, Pear. Thank you, Wink. Uh, I must perhaps start with saying that it's actually my wife who was on the power list. It's always my wife. I usually introduce myself uh, by saying, I'm the one who's married to Brit, my wife, because everyone knows her, no one knows me. Uh, we uh, make a living from uh, taking people around wineries. It's quite a nice job, uh, but it means that we have a product which is uh, quite difficult to explain in some ways. How do we explain our, our product, a uh, wine tour? Um, the most important thing with this is uh, to tell the story. 
And I guess I'm one year late because I think the last year's conference was uh, on the theme of the story, so I'm one year late on this. But the most important thing for us uh, when talking to our clients, customers, or prospects is to tell a story. It helps that we're also writers, bloggers, uh, um, journalists, because that's very much about storytelling. Uh, at the same time, I don't think it necessarily makes much of a difference what kind of a label you put on us, if it's a journalist or if it's a wine tour operator or something like that. Because first and foremost, the most important thing for us is, is that we're uh, wine enthusiasts. Uh, or is Luis Alberto here? No, he's not here. We're wine lovers. So, wine lovers. Um, and we do this. Because we do, we do this job because this is what we think is uh, very fun, very, uh, very interesting. It's, it's the greatest job in the world. Um, so uh, all of these different things that we do communicate around wine is about conveying our passion, which is not always very easy. Uh, so our biggest challenge as a tour operator um, is making people understand what it is they can expect from one of our wine tours. Uh, it's, it's not very easy to do that. Uh, the most important thing uh, about our product, about our wine tours, or about, in general about visiting vineyards, the most important thing is not that you get to taste the wines. The wines, uh, I hate to say this, but uh, in, in this kind of a visiting vineyards context, the wines are almost secondary. Uh, what is really important uh, is the people that you meet, the people that have stories to tell. Uh, and, and actually, coming back to, to one thing Sue said, uh, malolactic fermentation can be passionately interesting if you have someone who can tell the story and barrels and steel tanks. It's really interesting if you have someone who can tell the right story. And winemakers often can that, not all of them. Uh, but some winemakers can that. So the, the most important thing is actually the winemakers and the stories they tell. The second most important thing is the whole experience with the visits, the, uh, the environment. The, the, it's wine, wine uh, districts are often very beautiful. So looking at the vineyards uh, and having these fabulous meals that you can have in wine regions, that's the thing that people remember when they have been to, to the wine tours so that we organize. Uh, but, but how do you convey that? It's very difficult. I mean, you can write a text. We, do, we have a uh, wine tour program on our website, uh, and it says that we go visit uh, this and that in the morning, and then we have lunch, and it's a wonderful lunch, and then this and that in the afternoon, and it's a very nice visit. But uh, that's, everyone else says that too, and it's not very differentiating, and uh, it's not very different. Uh, Photography is one very important thing in this, and um, it, it's a very strong thing. It's a, uh, an efficient way of conveying feelings and, uh, and experiences. And so it's convenient that I'm also a photographer. Uh, video, uh, as well, is something that is very important, and almost uh, now more and more important. Video is a bit like uh, uh, an enhanced pho photograph, in a way. Uh, you can use it like that in, on, on uh, websites and on blogs. It's, uh, if you don't click it, it's a nice picture. If you click it, it brings you something additional. Uh, and as a parenthesis, video is also something which is extremely important from an SEO perspective. Uh, if you want to have uh, people visiting your, your site and your blog, vi videos is a very powerful tool. Uh, we, we've been doing this for uh, quite a long time, uh, over four years, uh, and been exper over five years actually. Uh, we've been experimenting with different kinds of videos, and videos is a very difficult medium to work with in some ways. It's very easy to take your iPhone or, or your smartphone uh, and make a video and uh, post it on YouTube, but it's not necessarily very powerful. Um, you have to think about the quality of what you do. Having a video which, where you can't hear what the people say, or you can barely make out what they're saying, where, where it's always shaky, uh, and you almost get seasick when you look at it, that's no good. Uh, so you have to make a little bit of an effort. Uh, we started out working with videos 
in a very ambitious way. So I could spend half a day editing a video to make it uh, kind of in decent shape to uh, post on the uh, on on the internet, uh, and that's not viable. You can't spend that much much time because we're all short of time, as I'm sure we are right now. Um, but um, so you have to really think about what you want to do with each video when you're in the vineyard before you start uh, filming the video. Uh, and really make sure that you almost get a uh, ready-to-use video out of, out of the camera, and one which is pleasant to watch. Um, you can see some, of the, some examples of what we do on our, on our website, or on one of our, our websites, on our wine tour site, bkwinetours.com. Um, it, we're actually starting to change the way we work with pictures and videos quite a lot uh, recently. Uh, we used to write stories more and then we put illustrations on the stories. Uh, more and more now, since actually only this summer, we're trying to do it the other way around. We're, we're starting with the images, we're starting with the videos, uh, and then we're putting the stories around those. And you don't really need much text uh, around. You, you have to have a certain amount of relevant text, but you don't need very much. Uh, but you can build very interesting stories, very fun stories, uh, around uh, a structured uh, series of uh, photos and, uh, and videos. Uh, so, uh, making some kind of a conclusion of this, uh, videos and photos uh, in communicating what we do is extremely important because it's a much more efficient way, I think, to convey the actual experience and feelings of visiting a vineyard. Um, you can see what we do on our websites or, or on our Facebook pages. We have four Facebook pages. Okay. Th thank you, Pear. And you can also sign up to... Pear's newsletter, um, which is one of the most packed newsletters um, I've ever seen, and you can see how they are actually linking in video and photography and writing um, to promote their wine tours. Sure, why not? Um, our third panelist uh, is uh, Wendy Crispell, who's flown all the way from New York um, to be on the panel and to enjoy the conference, of course. Um, uh, Wendy is um, a wine and food educator and a consultant and a writer. Um, she used to own a restaurant up in the Hudson Valley and has a passion for artisanal cheeses, which uh, for those of you from Europe who haven't traveled to the US recently, I can assure you there are way more interesting cheeses than there used to be or than if you were in the last debate, um, Robert Joseph mentioned Monterey Jack. I think it goes a bit further than that these days, and Wendy knows. Um, in recent years, she's become well qualified in wine, and her focus today is uh, running wine courses and cheese courses. Um, she had a, a blog post on the Wine Travel Guides blog, shortlisted in the Wine Tourism category of the Bourne Digital Awards um, this year. And she's also won acclaim in, uh, for her food and wine pairings on snooth.com. So, um, Wendy, I um, know that you, you'd like to share a few things with us, and I really wanted to know what it is that your clients, who I know are both trade and consumers, what they particularly appreciate when you link the wine and food together in your talks and in your writing. What, is your, what do they look to you for? I guess I'm the food nerd in the panel. Um, I dream about food, I really do. <laughs> okay, um, I, um, I get a lot of questions about food pairings. Uh, I plan a lot of dinners, a lot of regional wine and cheese pairings, um, but also a lot of dinners throughout the city. And I'm lucky enough to live in a city, New York City, where there's many different cultures and many different uh, historical things that you can also research. Uh, being uh, seriously into food, I got my first cookbook when I was five years old. Um, and I have now over 600 cookbooks uh, in my Hudson Valley home. Before uh, the internet, I used to go to the library when I traveled and I would research all the food and all the wine of the region that I was going to visit. Uh, now it's so much easier going online and researching all of this. 
But mostly what my clients want to know is the, the food and wine, um, whatever region that I'm focusing on, what grapes, uh, m more unusual wines, and more authentic food, the history of it. And since I've been cooking, since I was a small girl, I've always assumed that people know how to cook. And people will ask me, if someone asked me for a recipe once for a mozzarella and tomato salad. And I was like, wow, don't you just buy the tomatoes, buy the mozzarella, go home, slice it, add some olive oil? You can't assume that people know the most simplest things in a simple recipe. So when I post and uh, when I do newsletters and when I do, sometimes I teach cooking classes and pairing classes, Start with the most basic. I take pictures of every step of every recipe, and it, people seem to really enjoy this, and when I do a post without it, they want to know why didn't I include uh, the picture of all the little dishes of each spice that you're supposed to use. And if you decide to do a post like this, uh, make sure that you have a little pen and paper alongside of you, and you do all the measurements and make it twice. Make it first uh, for yourself and then invite a bunch of people over and do this again. And many people do really like um, the posts of recipes and wines together and they can recreate the experience of where they've traveled or where you've traveled. Because I, I get a lot of people say to me, um, okay, I went to this region and, and I brought the wine home and it just didn't taste the same. Well, you have to recreate in your mind and on paper the surroundings where you've been um, because if you take the same wine that you had, uh, say, in, in a wonderful surrounding sitting outside by a lake and you take that same wine and you drink it in a paper bag in a park, it's simply not going to taste the same. You have to recreate... Um, on paper and in their mind, the surroundings, the food that they've had, and let them experience a delicious meal and the wines to go with it. And with a little research, and uh, you can find all these recipes. And also, um, I do the bank links on all the spices, because these may be hard to find once, uh, once they get home or from your experience um, where you've got them. There's many places now online where you can order very different things from all over the world, and also a, a lot of the wines. Um, and the cheeses, uh, very difficult, um, because some things, especially for me in the US, are actually legal to bring back, so some things they can only dream about. But it will give them the chance if they go over to experience it themselves. Thank you very much, Wendy. I'm glad you live the dream as well, um, and share it, more importantly. Our fourth and final panelist uh, stepped in rather last moment. Um, in your uh, brochures in print, it will say Molly Horvoker, but in fact, uh, Paula Titch has um, replaced Molly because Molly couldn't come over. Um, Paula is um, from the UK. She's a communications consultant with her own business in London. Um, but she also has her own wine blog, which now I'm reading it, um, I can tell you, is called Sip, Swoosh, Spit. You can tell why I couldn't um, say it earlier. Um, importantly to me, um, Paula trained as a real live journalist. Now, I don't mean a wine journalist, a real one working for some major news organizations. And uh, today in her blog, Travel and Food feature regularly. Um, so I particularly wanted to ask Paula as a professional journalist, um, how she considered that we can link these three subjects, wine, food and travel, perhaps without our posts and articles becoming too long, always a challenge for me. Thank you, Paula. So I don't earn my living from wine writing, so you could say that what I do is an indulgence. And when anything is an indulgence, uh, it automatically lends itself to put in as much as you like and let what you write go on forever, potentially. So um, what I'll do is really share with you just the approaches I take to, if you like, self-check. Um, so that I try not to put it, you know, I try not to make my posts longer than maybe a thousand words, which I know to some people is long, but I think when you're combining 
wine, food and travel. Um, I think it's tough to make it really short and, um, and share an experience. Um, I would say that the first thing that I think of is audience. And I hear a lot around the discussions in this conference, the one in Brescia last year on Twitter about the consumer. And I would say there are many different types of consumers. And when you start thinking oh, as a consumer, as one homogenous group, then you really don't know who you're talking to. So I have someone, and I would say also in terms of not just consumer, you also need to think about, are you writing for consumers? Or are you writing for trade? Are you doing B2B, business to business? Or are you doing consumers? And then if you decide you're doing consumers, as I am, you need to then think which consumer. And I see my readers as um, people who are lightly engaged in wine. They like wine, they like drinking wine, they're interested in wine, and they're also interested in food and travel, because like, they are linked. Um, and I guess that's why I'm tending to move more towards writing about wine, food, and travel, because it's hard to extrapolate them. But that's my, that's my consumer, lightly engaged. So when I write about, say, a visit to Etna recently, I might mention volcanic soil, um, but I'm not going to go into the deep specifications of what that means. I might talk about the color and the texture, but ultimately, what I'm trying to do is create an atmosphere, an experience, rather than explain how it's going to translate into the taste of the wine, because I think my lightly engaged wine reader um, is only going to go so far. They want to know, do they like it? And if you can create that experience and atmosphere, it might help them um, choose that wine over another one. I would also say it's important to have a hook or an angle, and that's two, two things. One is, if you're talking about travel, food, and wine, yes, they're linked, but one of them, um, one of them has to take precedence. With me, it's, it's going to be the wine, um, or the story around the wine, rather than the story around the food and the story about the location. But, um, so, so that's my angle, generally, but then within that, I think um, you then need to find your hook for the story, how you start it, what's going to be, what's going to be your opening, because, um, and I think this, I'm, this, I'm talking about writing here, but I, this is the same for, for, for doing videos. Um, you have to be as self-disciplined, if not more. Um, what's going to be your hook? Because once you've got your angle, I think the story helps tell itself. And to paraphrase Andrew Jefford yesterday, that you will weave the rest of your facts and information into a narrative necklace. I would, also, um, this, I would also say that what you leave out is arguably uh, more important than what you put in, because um, I, I spoke about indulgence, and indulgence, you can uh, put in what you like. And it's tough if you haven't got someone to read your piece and look it over and edit it to um, reduce what you put in. I do have someone who, who does read my pieces. I happen to be married to him and we met as journalists, so that helps. Um, and, but but it also um, helps to maybe write something, leave it for a couple of days, and then come back to it. Um, if you don't have an editor, because it's amazing what a different perspective you can get with two, three days grace. I wrote a piece on um, a recent trip to Virginia, and I've yet to post it because I wrote it, and I'm, I'm going to go back with a very critical eye and, and see whether I've got a strong angle in there, whether I've put in too much um, in there. So that's my process. Write something, leave it for a few days. And I think ultimately, to wrap up, we, we spoke, I've heard everyone talk about experience. Yes, you're trying to create an experience, but you also have to distill the essence of that experience. And that's, that, that, is, that is key. You can't tell, you can't put in everything. You can't um, talk about everything you saw, you tasted, you drank, you touched. You have to distill that 
into a story. So it's really looking for the essence of that experience. And ultimately, you're enticing your readers to then want to find out more. And that's where links are important uh, to add to your piece. Links can add so much that you don't have to say. Um, I would also just do a final um, word. I know that Pear was talking about video and, um, and the other elements you can, and photography and the other elements you can add. Um, but also break up your copy, if you're writing, with some subheads. Help the reader looking at your article or your post, what they're reading. Um, it's amazing how many people don't do that, and it really just visually makes it more enticing, and that's why you find um, online news websites doing that, feature, feature writers do that, break it up. Um, so really, that's, that's how um, I approach um, <coughs> writing about food, travel, and wine. Thank you all very much for giving your views. Um, some really solid tips there, um, practical tips from Paola. Um, some tasty cheese stories from um, Wendy, who, importantly, I wrote down, said, don't assume people know things. I think that's, that's hugely important. Um, and for Pear, who um, emphasised that what a beautiful environment that these wine tours are taking place in, and, and somehow through video and photography, we need to put that over as well as the words around it. And um, finally, Sue, who was... Um, reminding us that our communications need to be authentic. Um, they're about real people. Now, I'd love to bring as many of you in as wish to um, share a view and or ask a question. Uh, my name is Ben Spencer. I'm a recent transplant from California to Sicily. Uh, we've been there for 30 days. I have a blog, American, I have a blog AmericanWineWriter.com. My wife is an avid foodie. She has about 400 cookbooks. And um, we are trying to find our niche in a very strange environment, strange to me, native to her. How did you go about doing that? And uh, where did you find your success? Um, yeah, it's a little tough. Are, are you trying to transition to, to make a living? And OK. Um, Wow. You have to find your audience, which is very important. And um, I kind of had to look outside people that I knew and try to build an audience in different forms uh, where I knew that people were looking for information. Uh, different food sites, um, some different travel sites, and more for not the novice, not you know anyone that's a professional. And kind of built an audience around that. And I also did a lot of free things. Um, I volunteered to do things at different festivals, uh, to make something, to give out a recipe, to do a wine pairing, and sort of built on that. And it took a while. OK, thanks. Did you want to add anything, Pear, as someone that moved countries? Yeah, uh, I think the, uh, the most important thing is really yourself. Uh, what is it that you are uh, really enthusiastic about writing about? Uh, I don't think you can uh, look at the market and figure out that this is a niche that I will be successful in. I think you will uh, be successful if you do something that you're really passionate about and that you really like. Um, we didn't fall into the wine travel because we thought that it was a good business proposition. It, uh, I was working in a normal day job in an office and then suddenly that uh, company was liquidated uh, in uh, funny circumstances and uh, I, we decided to try and do something different and it was not a plan. Uh, take the opportunities that come, don't necessarily make a plan. So, so it's finding your niche, only you can do it. <laughs> you have to feel right. Any uh, further questions, debates? We need you because we all need to improve as well. Thank you. Hi, my name is Irene. Um, I live in Rome and I work as a food and wine writer. I was wondering if you could share some tips about when you interview a winemaker. They usually have their... Um, promotion talk ready and it's sometimes so hard to go beyond the passionate winemaker and I really 
was wondering, you know, what you do to go beyond that and really try to find the story. Great question. Um, very, very challenging one. I mean, personally, I'll just say that um, I tend to ask them the most difficult technical question early on so that they at least know that I um, know what I'm talking about. So that's one tip that I have. But Paula, do you have some more tips on getting past the bullshit? Um, I <laughs> just putting it bluntly. I would say, well, recently, when I, when I was in Virginia, um, the, my favorite line came out, my wine is made in the vineyard, not in the winery. <laughs> and I'm afraid my response was, yes, everyone says that now. Uh, and you've got, to, you've got to not be afraid of challenging, of challenging people, but I think you need to do your research beforehand as well. If there's not much about them, what is there around the topic? Um, because how they make their wine, there'll be, there'll be enough, y you will know something before you go and interview them. You will do your research, um, whether it's about them, whether it's about the area, whether it's about how they make their wines. So it's important to be prepared. I also, but I would say, on the other hand, don't be controversial for the sake of it, because sometimes it's about pulling a story out of someone. So it might not be what yeast they're using, but it might be the fact that their parents didn't want them to be a winemaker, or it might be that they almost went bust three times. So um, it's trying to pull that thread out of the story, and that is down to, to listening as well and, and having a conversation with them. Um, so go prepared, have your research with a set of questions, but then make sure you listen because if they then go off piste and start telling you a story, you can then you know start pulling pulling the story out of them. But it can be you know it can be challenging because there are some who are actually now quite well practiced at um, batting back the questions, and you just have to keep on at them. Thank you. Did you want to add to that, Pear? Yeah, I I, I certainly agree with uh, what you say. You have to know what you want to, to get out of it. You have, to, or at least you have to know who it is you're talking to. You have to uh, have a knowledge so that you can ask the right questions. Uh, coming there unprepared is not a very good idea. But the second thing is, usually this is not a problem. If you ask people uh, fairly simple, straightforward uh, questions, they tend to develop their own personal story. If they don't, you can ask them things which have to do about them, about how did they get here, how come you're a winemaker, you used to be a banker, what made you change your, your life? And, and, and focus on them, and most winemakers are really uh, very good at telling their own story about who they are. Hello, I'm Hande, also from Rome. Um, Per mentioned something, something, and also Wendy later, something related in my eyes. Uh, per was talking about that the story is important, and it's not necessarily the wine or the barrel or whatever, it's the story. And uh, Wendy mentioned that some people really do not even know the basics, like asking about a caprese salad uh, recipe. Um, this is something that I'm struggling with a lot lately, because... Um, um, I'm a wine educator, and usually I have people in front of me, and then it's really easy to read and understand them, like at what level are they? Are they going to be more enchanted by the stories or by the real information that I'm giving them, and I can adjust myself? But online, um, how do you do this? Like, there were all, you're online, you're always out there, readable by everyone, by the people who want to have just the stories and don't care about the facts or the quality of what you're offering. Uh, but there are also people who will be like, who will think that, oh, it's a theater show you're putting on, that's terrible. You know, how do you deal with that, that online, that you cannot choose your audience? That's a tough one. <laughs> who wants to answer that? Any thoughts? Wendy looks ready. <laughs> um, I, I just have decided who I'm going to write for. And that's, that's the bottom line. Um, I try to do middle of the road, nothing too geeky. Like Paolo said, um, the people that read uh, my columns, uh, uh, things that I do online, aren't necessarily interested in you know, the soil aspects or anything too technical. And that's who I just decided to write for. And 
put it out there like that. And it seems to get good response. I, I think that I can, I can also relate to what you're saying, having been a wine educator first and, and a writer second. Um, personally, when I do, I do exactly what I do in writing as I do in educating, in that I assume people won't understand a technical term. If I choose to use it, I explain it always. Um, Pair? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it's important what you say because you don't cho choose your readers. The reader chooses you. Um, and for that reason, I think it is important that you write or that anyone writes about things that you're interested in and about uh, in a way that you like. Uh, don't write technically if you're not technically interested. Or if you are uh, very interested in uh, the malolactic fermentations details, do write about that because there will be someone who's interested in it. So write in, a, in the way that you would like it to, to be when you read it. Or like uh, Tony Lathwaite said yesterday, he said that I'm writing for my friend Dr. John. He's talking to someone. It's something which is... which makes it real for you as a writer. I, I just would, just as that though, I, I think that it's all very well writing for what you want to write about, but you always have to have your audience in mind. Yeah. I like the technical aspects of winemaking, but I know it'll bore the pants off the person that, that I'm writing for. Okay, thank you. Arnold, do you have a question? Let me throw something a little bit controversial out here. I think about wine travel in the States and wine travel in Europe, I mean, Wine travel in the States is connected to shopping because there's this immense industry, direct to consumer, that's almost $2 billion a year. And so people like to carry through what they experience by buying things online. And I know I've gone to Wendy's tastings, and one of the things that she does that really works is she tells people where you can buy the wine. And I think this is really important because I think you can educate people, but I think what they really want to do is they want to extend the enjoyment. So if you, buy a, if you taste something and it's nice, the ability to make it less painful, to acquire the bottle, to carry on this thing and to share it forth, I think is a really good thing. And the, and the more you can correct, connect, connect your ability of what you're sharing with someone to your ability to buy it and share it again, I think this is a really good thing for consumers. That's great, and I actually like Sue to give some comments on that because I know that in South Africa there are quite a few online wine selling operations that, that will export and so on, and how does that link with wine tourism? Could you... Uh, um I think the wineries that are into wine tourism make sure that customers can order at the winery. So they will have set up arrangements. Some of them um, work through a third party, some of them do it directly, but there's always the opportunity to buy wine, and I agree with you. I mean, that's why the wineries are into wine tourism at the end of the day it's to sell more wine. So really our communications need to include those links to how to buy. Yeah, Pam? Uh, what, what you say, Arnold, is very true that it is very different. It is very different in different places. Uh, in Europe, uh, which is our major destination, uh, buying wine at the winery is not a big thing. It's not important for the winemaker or the winery who receives that people buy. Because everyone comes there on an airplane and you can't carry things with you home. And you can't buy on mail order over the internet either because it's cross borders. So well, you can, but it's very complicated. So people have other motives. In the end, it's the same motives. They want to sell more wine, but what you're really delivering to, to, the, to my customer is an experience, uh, a wow thing, rather than an opportunity to buy. Uh, there's one more question from over here, which is good because this will be from a different nationality. Excellent. Uh, Jean-Luc, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm French, from Paris. Um, Paula said that um, most of the uh, winemakers always speak about uh, uh, the land, the technology. Uh, I, I went to about, I don't know, 1,000 wineries. Um, most of the time it's family story, it's about nature and about process. About process, nature, family, about uh, family, uh, process, nature, always the same blah blah. It's normal because 
the, all the winemakers want to explain what are they doing. And that's their way to explain. Plus, when you taste, they will explain the wine. Um, we have maybe to find something more interesting. Um, just an example. Um, we had a wonderful conference <coughs> yesterday with <coughs> sorry, Jose Bouillamos and, uh, and Patrick McGovern about uh, ampelography. I went in Montpellier um, two months ago to meet uh, Pierre Gallet, which is the oldest ampelograph in the world, and he knows uh, everything about ampelography. I don't want to speak to him about ampelography because it's very specific, but when he told me about the way he met the king of Afghanistan in 1967 and, ma and make for the king the wine, that's interesting, and that's a very interesting way to show how this guy traveled all around the world and make ampelography and wine in, in a specific uh, time. And that's the best way to explain what is the, the life of Pierre Gallet. Okay, many, many thanks for that. I don't think that was a question, so I think, but it was interesting nonetheless. Um, my conclusion is really to say that I, I think this was a session that was the, around the theme of last year's conference combined with this year's conference. So last year's conference, the theme was about telling stories, and that has come up um, strongly from all our panelists, that that's what we should all be doing in our communications. But this year's conference, um, the theme is sources, and, and that's been what I've been trying to, to put over, that we need to become those trusted sources. So. Um, I hope you've, you've gained something from our panelists and thanks for your attention.